Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Particle Micronization, a Tool for Enabled Pharmaceutical Formulations. My name is Meg Snyder, and I'm the editor of Pharmaceutical Processing. Uh, I'll be serving as a moderator for today's event. Now, before I begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Capsigel. I also want to encourage everyone in attendance to take advantage of the interactive nature of this webinar platform by submitting questions at any time during the presentation. This can be done by typing your questions into the corresponding box on your screen, and we'll save all questions until the end of the presentation and attempt to answer them in the time allotted for Q&A. And it's my pleasure to introduce Audi Kaushal. Dr. Audi Kaushal is a senior research Fellow at Bend Research, he leads a group focused on development and manufacturing of pharmaceutical formulations for early stage projects. His areas of expertise are immediate and controlled release oral formulations based on crystalline API or spray dried dispersion intermediates. Prior to Bend Research, in, um, prior to joining Bend Research in 2010, he was a postdoctoral associate at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Minnesota. He holds a Master of Science Pharmaceutics degree and a PhD in Pharmaceutical Technology from the National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research in India. I would also like to introduce TJ Higley. TJ is the Head of Quality at Powder Size Incorporated. He oversees the development and onboarding of all incoming milling micronization classification projects for the company, supporting pharmaceutical formulations with bioavailability challenges and improving reproducibility within the finished dosage forms. His area of expertise are particle size reduction and control and ensuring suitable CGMP systems and control are integrated throughout the product development and commercial manufacturing. Prior to joining Powder Size in 2005, Higley held business development and engineering roles with Toso Bioscience and Eastman Kodak respectively. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chemistry and a Master of Science degree in Biochemistry from the University of Northern Colorado, as well as a Master's of Business Administration from Portland State University in Oregon. So thank you all for joining us today, and I will turn it over to TJ. Great. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's webinar presented by Capsigel's Dosage Form Solutions business. My name is TJ Higley, and I'm the VP and Head of Quality and part of the Dosage Form Solutions business of Capsigel since our acquisition was announced late last year and became effective uh, in early January of this year. Since that time, we've been actively integrating the powder size offerings within the Capsigel model, and this webinar is our first integrated webinar with Ben Research. The topic for today is API micronization and its use in bioavailability enhancement, as well as other applications. Adi Kosho is a senior fellow with Ben Research and will join me today. So before we begin, a brief roadmap and agenda is in order. Uh, we will spend a little bit of time overviewing Capsigel and specifically the dosage form solutions business within Capsigel and their approach to pharmaceutical advancement, and introduce the range of technology platforms that are available within dosage form solutions. We'll move on to the content for the webinar, which is micronization, and provide a brief overview and the principles of how it works and the quality attributes, as well as how the process is controlled. Adi will then uh, review two case studies in which micronization was used for bioavailability enhancement as well as uh, enabling a delayed release multi-particulate bead system. Lastly, we'll wrap up with uh, the capabilities at powder size in terms of equipment and scale and analytical capabilities and the advantages of uh, a specialist in API micronization, and then wrap up with a summary. So to get started, the way Capsigel approaches pharmaceutical development is to employ an integrated product development model from early feasibility work through scale-up and optimization and ultimately the commercial manufacturer of finished dosage forms. Capsigel is unique in that they have been able to develop deep expertise in drug design 
to meet the target product profile and the commercial objectives of the client projects. In working with thousands of compounds over the last two decades across the legacy companies that make up DFS, uh, they bring quite a bit of expertise to that process. There's a wide range of technologies and bioavailability enhancement, targeted and controlled release, and other enabling technologies that facilitate the optimal product design versus a force-fitting uh, and use of a specific technology where its application boundaries may be stretched or sub-optimized or even exceeded. To this end, we have also extensively investigated and mapped the operation space of each of these technologies, which has led to predictive modeling and technology selection methodologies that yield rapid design and minimize the API experiments and requirements. Clients also rely on Capsigel for process development, and our engineering core has facilitated the development of a number of proprietary technologies and equipment to facilitate successful product development. And lastly, we hire fundamental scientists, such as chemists and mathematicians, material sciences and scientists and engineers, which tend to complement the application scientists, which typically make up the client teams. This team approach uh, for, forms a powerful combination in addressing complex problem statements. Along with the approach, this slide overviews the technology breadth within Capsigel dosage form solutions. And many clients' projects would require more than one of these technologies to meet target product profiles. We do not promote any specific technology or finished dosage form presentation. We have the range and the op options and flexibility to meet the target profile, uh, product profile and the client commercial requirements. But I'd like to touch on a few key areas which lead into some of the topics that we're going to cover today. First, some of the problems that are um, in the industry that Dosage Forms Solutions addresses is an overwhelming population of low solubility technology, uh, low solubility within, with at least two-thirds of a majority of new compounds being BCS Class 2 and Class 4. Capsigel DFS has a premier range in bioavailability enhancement in which API micronization is a component, along with spray-dried dispersions, hot melt extrusion, lipid-based approaches. And the technology that is chosen is dependent on a range of factors, and these factors can be modeled with the 20 years experience and thousands of compounds that have been uh, investigated and, and worked on through the years with DFS. Next, Capsigel has a full range of modified release approaches, which tends to complement the bio, uh, bioavailability enhancement offerings and allows us the flexibility in meeting drug release and site targeting requirements. Third, we are increasingly leveraging our multi-particulate technology range, which includes fluid bed processing, melt spray congealing, extrusion, serenization, and mini tabs. And the technology chosen here is dependent on a range of API and formulation factors. We can add taste masking expert expertise and specialized sprinkle capsules, uh, which are often used in conduct conjunction with multi-particulate approaches, uh, namely in the pediatric, pediatric and uh, geriatric applications. And particle engineering, either via spray drying or micronization approaches are key in meeting pulmonary delivery challenges, and this is an additional area where our capsule technology can also be leveraged. All clients are concerned with rapid and cost-effective product development. Our toolkit to ensure rapid investment includes the aforementioned technology selection methodologies, minimizing and avoiding time-consuming empirical evaluations of different approaches phase-appropriate equipment from specialized lab scale through commercial is available, micro-dosing for PIC evaluations with Capsigel's Excella dose equipment, and manufacturing of solid oral dosage forms 
uh, primary and secondary packaging and distribution of clinical trial materials is also available. So with that overview of Capsigel's dosage form solutions business, I would like to now delve into micronization specifically and, and uh, the benefit and for the benefit of the uninitiated members within our audience today, we'll start with a brief overview of micronization and how it works, uh, as well as some applications in which it was used uh, within case studies. So jet milling and micronization is, is primarily achieved uh, through the use of jet mills. Uh, jet mills use compressed gas, namely compressed air at commercial scale, but it also can be uh, nitrogen during development and pilot scale uh, operations. The compressed gas is delivered to a spiral jet mill, which is pictured on the left, uh, through a manifold ring, the blue area, and that compressed gas is led into the grinding chamber area, which is the white area, through nozzles that are drilled in a grinding ring. Those nozzles are drilled in such a way to form a tangent circle and basically establish a a uh, tornado-like flow path for the particles. And it, it certainly is a top-down approach. Uh, as the particles assume the tornado, they are accelerated to supersonic speeds, and particle attrition occurs from there. It's, um, the advantages of using a jet mill with, you know, essentially wind-powered um, uh, mechanisms is that it's an ambient process. That compressed gas comes in uh, at pressure as high as 115 PSI and expands instantaneously within the grinding chamber to atmospheric pressures of around 14 PSI. That drop in pressure uh, instantaneously is a cooling effect, and that cooling effect can overcome and neutralize any localized heat from two particles colliding within the tornado. So those Frictional heat gains are instantly uh, reduced and minimized uh, through the uh, blanketing of cooling air. So the inlet air is the same temperature as the outlet air, and the entire process is ambient. Second big advantage is because it is, quote unquote, wind powered, there are no metal moving parts within the jet mill. So it's, it's unlike any mechanical milling or rotor stator concept that you may be familiar with. Um, so that thereby reduces the risk of metal wearing into the product, blades wearing, screens breaking, so on and so forth. So it's a key advantage that has been looked at for metal contamination and is uh, far reduced relative to other milling technologies. And lastly, what is output from the jet mill is a controlled particle size distribution curve. All particles within the tornado experience a like energy environment, so there's equal treatment, and what results is a Gaussian distribution or bell curve of particles. And that distribution is very narrow. It can be slid up and down an x-axis to achieve uh, a range of particle sizes uh, that the client would need or desires for their formulation. And more importantly for bioavailability enhancement, that distribution can be sub-10 microns with average particle sizes uh, in the low single digits. And then lastly, because it's very homogeneous milling environment for the particles, it is, and the result is a Gaussian distribution, the result is, or the process is very reproducible between batches and between milling campaigns. To reiterate that, I brought in an example of a commercial product uh, that is micronized at powder size. Uh, and each one of these batches on the x-axis uh, is well over a metric ton, and this represents uh, around 18 metric tons of commercial API product uh, annually. I took the D90 channel, which is a worst case example, to highlight the precision and the reproducibility of the process. So, for example, uh, this entire year, with not only release tests, 
but all the in-process tests included, you can see that the D90 channel is averaging 6.5 microns with a standard deviation well less than a half a micron at the D90 channel. So at the top or the D50 uh, center point of the particle size distribution curve, the variability is even much less. And from min to max, you're only looking at uh, one and a half microns roughly between um, uh, lower or greater than the uh, average particle size. In terms of process control and the mechanism, uh, again, that spiral pancake that was shown before uh, is pictured here with a diagram of forces. And really, the primary forces uh, in this physics process is the acceleration of particles to supersonic speeds to form the tornado. Within the tornado, centrifugal force really holds the large and uh, high mass and large particle size particles to the outside of that tornado to be further attrited and have additional uh, particle size reduction. As that occurs, a gradient is established of finer and finer particles moving towards the center of the tornado or the, the exit of the spiral jet mill. And at a certain point, uh, nominally around two microns, the particle size and the mass of that dust-like particle no longer has enough mass to be held in the mill by centrifugal force, and the drag force of the exiting and spent process air is able to carry away the micronized particles over to collection. So how we can slide that particle size distribution up and down the x-axis is really primarily with two um, uh, CCPs or critical control parameters. The first and most precise would be to use the mill pressure uh, supplied to the grinding nozzles within the jet mill. And intuitively, if you would increase the mill pressure and increase the energy within the grinding chamber and the speed of the particles traveling in the tornado, more collisions and higher velocity collisions will occur, and that increased energy will drive down the particle size, so an inverse relationship by increasing mill pressure. The second uh, CCP that is often optimized uh, during development is the feed rate window uh, associated with how many particles would be in the grinding chamber at any given time. So that's a directly proportional relationship and uh, with any increases in feed rate, you are adding more material, uh, all things constant, within the grinding chamber to be amortized over that same pressure, so thereby lowering the average energy per particle. So an increase in feed rate would increase the particle size as that same energy is amortized around more particles. In addition to dry milling or spiral jet micronization, uh, powder size also has the ability to do with a newly acquired uh, Delta Vita mill, we have the ability to do wet milling processes with a bead mill. Uh, this is also capable of making micronized particles, but it also has the additional capability with longer milling time and higher energies the ability to make nanoparticles or sub one micron particles. And that mechanism is essentially taking a formulated product uh, with API and, and stabilizers and excipients and sending that through a recirculation loop into a grinding chamber that has a, a very high speed rotor and tip speed um, that is able to provide excessive shear uh, and grind the API uh, particles to nanoparticle size with, an, with the right formulation, the right bead size, the smaller the bead, the finer the particle size that can result, with ranging the RPMs to the right speed 
and shear, as well as uh, um, increasing the mill time to achieve the desired particle size. Uh, temperature is a big piece of this component, as well as the formulation, which contributes to the viscosity and uh, the stability of the overall end product. Um, so with that uh, temperature and heat, there's often a recirc tank to allow the API that experienced the grinding chamber to cool down before it's pumped through again. So with that brief overview, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Adi at Bend to take you through some case studies. Thank you, TJ. Um, if we want to uh, go over here the uh, application areas for micronization before we get into the case studies, um, we've listed on the top there some of the um, commonly enabled formulations where micronization um, can play a role. And this is definitely not an exhaustive list, but Certainly, most of the common areas that we um, experience within the capsule dosage form solutions. Um, the prime amongst them, as, as would come to mind, would be the bioavailability enhancement, where micronization, by, by virtue of decreasing the particle size and increasing the surface area, can afford a dissolution rate acceleration and thereby um, get the bioavailability enhancement. And we will go into one of the case studies um, uh, looking at the bioenhancement using the micronization of the API. But besides that, there are several other uh, formulations that are enabled. For example, one can imagine for content uniformity, the micronization of the API um, especially for low-dose compounds where you could uh, break down the API and, and the micronized form would like distribute better, would enable content uniformity. And, and uh, also then for inhibitor formulations, um, just enabling the right particle size so they can get, uh, they, they have the right kind of air aerodynamic diameter and, and get, a, get assimilated into the lung or nose. So those, those are some of the areas. The, the second case study that we'll go into today is actually about a multi-particulate formulation and about layering on the beads. And in that example, we would go over the milling of an excipient to enable a delayed release formulation. So if we looked at, uh, certainly TJ just went over the two ways to micronize uh, APIs or excipients. Uh, one amongst, obviously, is the dry milling or the air jet milling, where the micron range can be enabled. And then, then there is wet milling, where in addition to the micron range, as, as TJ pointed out, a sub-micron range is also possible. Um, and so what we've listed out here are some of the downstream um, uh, unit ops that may be used to then convert either the dry API powder or the suspension of the API into a final dosage form. And we routinely use a whole lot of these processes as listed here. So, just continuing here with the bioavailability enhancement concept, uh, a, a lot of lot in the audience are probably familiar with this system. Uh, the biopharmaceutics classification system is uh, is the system that a lot of regulatory agencies have adopted, and it basically divides the APIs in in terms of uh, uh, their solubility and permeability. And um, as, as TJ pointed out earlier, what you would see is that a large number of the candidates um, uh, that, that are yet to be drugs um, come from the category two or the category four. And that is the area where the solubility is, uh, is pretty low. And as opposed to that, what you would see there is the amount of marketed product are sort of equal, uh, equally more equally distributed than the number of candidates. And that is where um, the, the an enabling technology makes a difference in being able to convert a candidate into a marketed product. So 
uh, Capsiger DFS range of solubilization technologies uh, can certainly help convert a lot of those candidates and have been helping and, and uh, progressing them to the market. So the way we approach this is also with respect to uh, the maximum absorbable dose that's listed on the top there. Uh, and the maximum absorbable dose is essentially a, uh, a, a function of the solubility of the compound, the, uh, the permeability of the compound, which is essentially the Ka there, the small intestinal water volume, or, and the small intestinal uh, transit time. So essentially the function of all those four is what, what decides what maximum dose of a certain compound can be absorbed. And um, if we look in the class two of the BCS or the DCS system as it's uh, more commonly being uh, promoted right now, um, we have further subdivision into class 2A and 2B. And if you look at the 2B at the bottom there, um, that is a scenario where the projected human dose is more than the maximum absorbable dose. And so essentially what that means is the, the way we would enable um, the assimilation of the required dose would be to then increase the solubility, where a lot of enabling technologies like amorphous dispersions or lipid-based technologies can help, versus the condition at the top right where we have the 2A, um, and this is a condition where um, the dose is actually less then the maximum absorbable dose, but what, what really needs to be changed is the, in, the dissolution rate. And so in this case, the particle size reduction, micronization being one of the techniques there, and then obviously nano sizing being the other can help. So on, on this next slide, we have shown um, how we, uh, within the capsule dosage form solutions, how we approach an incoming compound on, on, uh, from a bioavailability enhancement uh, perspective. And, and this, this uh, plot is, is definitely not, uh, you know, it's not exactly accurate, but what, what that helps us is uh, being able to place a compound in a certain design in a certain space with respect to the lipophilicity of the compound as you would see on the x axis there and the solubility of the compound that you see on the y axis there and it kind of defines for us um, sort of the technology that is most appropriate for a certain molecule so as you would see there for uh, crystalline compounds the the green area there um, th those are the compounds where the level of solubility and uh, the lipophilicity, um, the crystalline form of the API in itself is well absorbed, and so by enhancement is, is likely not needed, um, versus areas in the high log P uh, compounds where um, the use of the lipids or the set system is most appropriate. And then there are uh, areas where uh, the compound has uh, just enough solubility and it's sort of on the borderline and uh, between the crystalline and the amorphous state uh, with respect to the solubility and dissolution rate. And that's where the micronization or the nanocrystals can help. So, um, so the way we approach, like I said, uh, is when the comp compound comes to us in-house, we, we're definitely taking the input from how the client has learned about that molecule, but placing it on this map helps us define a, a startup technology from that and, and you know, a startup point from where we'll go forward. And I should state that there are definitely other uh, considerations that are not uh, mentioned here. For example, there's the dose of the compound of, or the permeability that, that can um, influence as well. Uh, on this slide is shown a literature example of what uh, particle size reduction can do. Um, on the top uh, left is shown the particle size achieved by hammer milling or air jet milling or nanocrystals. As you would expect, it is successively smaller. On the um, top right side, we have the in vitro dissolution rate reflecting um, those uh, particle size changes. 
And um, this is a nice study because uh, in this particular case, they did the pharmacokinetics of this compound in, in dogs. And what you would see there is at the bottom, both the rate and the extent of absorption is enhanced um, is enhanced by particle size reduction. So from going from a hammer milled particle size of let's say 10 to 100 microns um, to jet milled, which is smaller, we are increasing both the extent and the rate of bioavailability. And then uh, certainly the nanocrystals can afford even more uh, bump in solubility and dissolution rate. And and um, although Based on our, our uh, MAD calculation, it does appear that in this particular study, the benefit that we are seeing with nanocrystals is more than one would expect purely from a particle size alone. So in, in that case, probably it is, uh, it is an ad additional contribution coming from certain stabilizers or, or, or probably a, a form conversion of the API. So that brings us to one of our case studies where we evaluated micronization for the uh, API. Uh, the target product profile for this compound was uh, a high-loading high tablet formulation that we had to prepare. Um, we, needed, uh, we knew from the beginning that we would need the bioavailability enhancement for this poorly soluble compound um, for the dose of about 150 milligram. Um, the compound had previously been dosed in the clinic with a uh, capsule dosage form where it was non-progressible for reasons of low active loading and therefore um, the focus was really on getting the loading to be higher while retaining the exposure. And uh, both dry and wet granulation was acceptable in this case. So um, the, the first step that we took with this particular compound was to do in silico modeling. And um, a lot in the audience might be uh, familiar with the Gastro Plus program that can um, simulate uh, the in vivo exposure. And we certainly use that uh, program here at Ben Research to project what kind of absorption we can get. But in addition, we do also have our in internal um, then research biopharmaceutics model that we used in this particular instance to model uh, what a particle size reduction would translate to for fraction dose absorbed. And, and that's what is shown on the bottom right there. As you can see, the as is API, which happened to be about 80 microns in this case, um, part of the modeling showed us that the fraction dose absorbed would be about um, 20%. And it also showed us that we needed to be uh, 8 microns or below for this particular API to get to the complete um, dose absorption. So this is, this is where we determined that the micronization would be, um, would be important. So for this particular case study, our focus was, one, on identify, identifying a micronization process, but then, two, um, focusing on incorporating then then micronized drug into a dosage form that would then retain the benefits of the high surface area achieved through micronization. So the first approach we took to micronization was air jet milling for this particular compound. Uh, we looked at a couple of milling conditions um, that we presented here where we changed the, um, the feed rate of the uh, powder and the grinding pressure, and we were able to identify conditions where we can get the particle size of the API reduced from a D50 of about 80 microns to about uh, 8 microns or 4 microns, and highlighted in green is the condition that we chose um, to progress to the dosage form. Um, so uh, this, I should also uh, mention that this was done using a two-inch uh, pancake-style uh, mill, and TJ is going to go over later uh, about with our capabilities, uh, starting all the way from that size mill to, to uh, much bigger mills that can have much higher throughput. 
In this particular case, uh, however, with the limited amount of API that we had at that time, we uh, blended the API, dry granulated it with excipients, and compressed it on a tablet press. And um, as, as we were uh, expecting, based on the particle size reduction, the dissolution of those tablets looked pretty good. However, we did see that um, we encountered some uh, flow concerns and there was some punch sticking that prevented us from progressing this particular dosage from process. And that's the reason we, all, we looked at wet granulation as an alternate to this process. So talking of wet granulation, um, uh, you know, you would also see there we also shifted from an air jet milling to a wet milling. And the reason for that was the wet milling sort of allows you a convenient um, and, and, and gives you a convenient suspension that you can then essentially use towards wet granulation. So um, we used a, uh, a dyno mill in this case uh, to select the conditions and um, and as you can see, again, we were able to achieve the particle size down to that uh, below 10 micron level, which we needed in this case. Um, we also confirmed uh, in this case and also in the air jet milling case that the API physical form had not changed, uh, which is something that we would always do with uh, any micronization project. And... Um, and uh, and, and then the, the selected time that we had here for mean residence time was about four minutes. As you can see, it's a pretty robust process in terms of uh, giving a pretty reproducible particle size uh, within, within a certain mean residence time window. So at the bottom of this slide, we've also mentioned some of our uh, wet milling capabilities. Um, and uh, what you would see there is we also have, in addition to the dyno mill and the delta vita, uh, we have a custom mills where we can um, take a pretty material sparing approach and get down to uh, milligram quantities of API and evaluate really, really small quantities and look for the particle size reduction and, uh, and have in vitro dissolution methods to screen those. So, so in this case, uh, once we had identified a, um, a, 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 through wet milling, a suspension, API suspension, we then proceeded to the granulation process. And uh, the granulation process that we selected was a fluid bed top spray granulation um, and then leading all the way to the tableting. Um, you would see there that uh, this process is, is uh, a little bit um, unconventional in the sense that all of the API in this case was in the suspension with the binder and the excipients. Um, and and um, the starting bed uh, essentially was composed of fillers and uh, disintegrants. And we sprayed on the API and achieved a high active loading granulation. Um, the granulation is uh, uh, pictured here as well at the bottom right. And uh, certain qualities that, uh, that we were looking forward to in this case and we did achieve was um, a high porosity of the granulation. Um, we had also learned um, previously, as we have, sh had, as I have shown, that this API was prone to sticking, and so uh, we wanted to embed the API um, within this granulation, and so we, we were able to achieve that. And downstream, we did not see any um, sticking issues at all. Uh, we were also able to, for this formulation, show that in our uh, discriminating dissolution test, uh, when compared to the fit for purpose formulation, we uh, matched or actually slightly exceeded the, uh, both the, uh, the, the rate at which the dissolution was happening. So uh, the, the, I think the key message here is that uh, not only did we identify a micronization process for this particular API based on the modeling that we did and the API attributes, but we focused uh, on preserving the micronization benefits all the way into the tablet dosage form, and that was key to this uh, successful formulation.
So uh, this brings us to a second, the second case study here in the webinar today. And uh, this uh, case study is about delayed release multiparticulate beads. And it uh, hopefully it will show you a diverse applicability of the micronization process as we, as we view it within the DFS here. Um, in that, this particular example, we're moving from the bioavailability enhancement to now enabling a delete release for, uh, formulation. Um, and then in addition, this particular case, we were actually micronizing an excipient to enable this technology. The target product profile in this case was a fixed dose combination of uh, two drugs um, in capsules. And a drug A was intended to release uh, uh, in an I immediate release fashion, and drug B was was uh, supposed to be released in uh, with a four-hour delayed pulse. And so, for this, for the purpose of this case study, we're only going to focus here today on drug B. Um, and the delayed release, like I said, was enabled by the micronization of an excipient in this case, as we'll just go through. And in this particular case, we used a uh, a bottom spray Wooster fluid bed coating to enable this. This particular slide shows the importance of particle size in general um, within the suspension, whether it's the APA or the excipient that we're looking at in this particular case study. And what's shown here is a is a uh, representation of the bead surface at the bottom. So that arc, the green arc at the bottom, is our attempt at showing uh, the relative size of about 800, 900 micron bead um, when compared to the API particle size. So what you would see there is on the left are um, non-milled uh, API with a D50 of about 25 microns. And on the right, that particle size has now been reduced by more than 10x. And uh, the point to make here is that the coating efficiency that you will see there when you're trying to stick those large particles on the left-hand side onto this bead surface, you can imagine um, not all of those particles are going to stick and uh, be incorporated during the uh, the coating process versus when you move on to the right hand side and you have a much smaller particle, um, the particles stick a whole lot better and the coating efficiency in this particular case was um, close to 100%. So for, for our particular case study here, uh, we were using um, Cross Carmelo sodium or Acdesol is one of the common uh, brand names for this API, uh, for this excipient, excuse me. Um, and what we have here is a schematic on the left hand side for the formulation that we were trying to um, accomplish. And what it has is a core in the middle of um, essentially a selfier core. Um, coated with a drug layer that's shown in light green there, then coated with a swelling layer, which is the cross Carmelo sodium shown in orange, and then the dark green layer on top again, which is essentially the barrier layer um, made out of an insoluble polymer. Uh, in this case, it was aqua coat with TEC as a plasticizer. And what's shown on the bottom right there is uh, essentially just a reality of the schematic on the left where you would see all those um, three layers and the core. But the, 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 way this, uh, the way we were able to enable this particular concept was to take the non-micronized cross carmelo sodium that's shown on the top right, right uh, uh, SEM image there. And as you can see, and, and probably a lot of you are familiar with, the cross carmelo sodium essentially has an aspect ratio of almost a thread-like geometry. And so in this particular case, um, this was a project we worked on a few years back before powder size uh, and band research were part of capsule gel dosage form solutions, and powder size was actually involved in micronizing 
the cross column of sodium on, on shown on the top there and reducing the D90 from uh, what's listed there to a D90 uh, below 20 microns. And um, that's what enabled us to, um, to deposit the cross column of sodium in this layer. And so to, just to go over how the system particularly works, uh, although it's, it's, uh, the micronization is en enabling that, um, the barrier layer that's shown, that's the outermost layer, is an insoluble polymer. And so when this bead is put in an uh, uh, aqueous environment, whether in vitro or in vivo, the water is taken up. Um, the swelling layer, because it is uh, a super disintegrant essentially, uh, it, it swells up by several, uh, several times in volume, and that causes the barrier layer to break open, releasing the API. And that is how we accomplish the delayed release. So I just want to uh, finish the case study here by uh, showing that we were able to uh, tune the uh, lag time for this particular release by changing the barrier coat weight. So going from 15 to 18 to 20 percent, as you can see, we can extend out the time until which the delay is uh, there before the drug is uh, released over the next hour or so. We also showed that this particular uh, technology is, is insensitive to environmental pH as one might expect from any osmotic coating technology. And um, that's also the reason we, why we also got a very good in vivo um, in v, uh, IV, IVC for a particular uh, coat weight percent here. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to TJ to go over um, the capabilities at powder size for particle size reduction. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let me advance the slide. So at powder size, uh, one of our capabilities uh, since our formation in, in 1994 and over 20 years of experience has been the design and manufacture of our own jet mills in-house. Uh, we did that primarily at the start of the company uh, to have a, a sanitary design and easily cleanable jet mill. Um, when initially when jet milling came into the space um, from other industries, there was not a good pharma designed uh, jet mill available and they really should have been product specific type pieces of equipment due to some low level cross contamination. Uh, so our mills uh, and, as well as Every uh, jet mill manufacturer in the pharma space now has a pharma design in which you can clean all the product contact areas as well as the non-product contact areas or specifically the, uh, the air distribution manifold and removal of a grinding ring. Uh, since that time, our jet mills have been modified uh, to be more suitable for a contract uh, service type business in which all of our pieces of equipment, including the mill, uh, roll on, on custom stands with uh, casters, uh, counterweighted doors, so, uh, uh, and, and toolless entry to make uh, the dry cleanings and, and inspection of mills during campaigns to be uh, uh, very efficient. Um, so that provides a benefit uh, for the commercial manufacturer for several of our clients uh, in terms of uh, commercially available equipment. And with the ability to develop our own designs, we've been able to vary the internal geometry of that uh, tangential circle or the, uh, the grinding ring, the nozzles that are drilled in that ring, the way that the raw material is delivered to the mill, uh, the Inlet Venturi, uh, one, of the, one of the pressures that we uh, look at is the feed pressure to accelerate particles into the jet milling where size control can start to happen. Uh, so we're, we have adjustable um, Venturis uh, to allow us to do that. And we also are not locked into a commercially available si style in terms of the outlet piping coming from the jet mill. So we can 
tweak that for potential buildup issues and allow for longer run times or get through an entire batch if it's a very cohesive uh, material per se. And then as well as, uh, you know, many people, uh, you know, have limited CapEx and uh, may have one or two jet mills available in-house uh, or to a certain scale. Uh, we offer a full range of uh, jet mill sizes and styles, and we can touch on that in the next slide. So with a one-stop sh one shop, we can really pick the right mill from a wide selection of jet mills in the space uh, to pick the right mill for the right batch size or yield requirements or really throughput for um, commercial economics. So we have two-inch mills uh, being the smallest to do gram-level type quantities with very low loss. Um, we typically come in anywhere from 5 to 10 grams as a starting batch size, and we, we prefer 10 to uh, achieve an 80% type yield with a, a small quantity of API. Uh, we can continue up from there to 4-inch mills, 8-inch mills, 10-inch mills, 14, and 30-inch mills, uh, which are some of the largest in the GMP space and fairly unique in the industry to use such a large jet mill. When the, when the mills get very large, you need a tremendous amount of compressed air capacity that not all facilities uh, have available to them uh, and the real estate requirements to have uh, a separate uh, compressor for each jet mill. And so with that, we are able, with 30-inch mills, to move metric tons of sub-10 micron material uh, per day in terms of throughput and process efficiency. So it, it allows us to compete very well in an excipient marketplace, but also for uh, pharmaceutical clients that may experience milling in-house to be a bottleneck um, or where they want to focus uh, on new product development uh, and offload some of the uh, already uh, tech transfer out some established products uh, to a, a CMO type provider. And the table uh, shown shows typical batch sizes, typical losses um, uh, that we would pursue. And you know, it, that would be our expertise is really to pick the right mill for once we understand your batch size and the level of control and what your commercial requirements will be. Um, and the scale up between mills is fairly uh, straightforward. Um, most times the mill pressure is very seldomly changed. What is determined from developmental pilot scale to be um, effective at achieving the particle size, and then it's just varying the feed rate to accommodate the new volume of the grinding chamber. In addition to a wide range of jet mills, uh, we have a variety of top-down approaches in a, a CMO that specializes in particle size reduction. So uh, just want to allude to it, it's not micronization per se, but uh, there are quite a bit of milling technologies in-house, um, including hammer mills at all scales from benchtop L1As to the D6A pictured on the left-hand photo to some massive D12As that are, can run hundreds of kilos per hour and throughput. Uh, the hammer mills we use for uh, certain customers that uh, uh, have agglomerates through trade drying or have prills uh, through a, uh, a spray drying or congealed type process and they need a powder. Uh, we also have pin mills to get slightly finer than a, a hammer mill could and get sub 100 micron type distributions. This tends to be a little bit more homogeneous and representative environment, so you start to get a, a tighter particle size distribution curve uh, that's under 100 microns. We can do quadro uh, cold mills as well for a uh, for coarse and, and repowderizing uh, materials as well. For the jet milling and the micronization that we do, more and more compounds are uh, having high potency or low OEL limits. And for that, we have some specialty containment equipment that we can put our micronizers in at a wide variety of scales. So we have a 
uh, rigid wall isolator that's able to do two inch and four inch mills. Uh, it can run bash mode or continuous, just like non-contained processes. And we do some commercial work at low volume within the uh, uh, rigid wall isolator. And then we have a recently used and qualified uh, soft wall system for a 10-inch mill, which would be certainly uh, capable of doing uh, clinical trial supply quantities, you know, up to uh, uh, low hundreds of kilos type quantities under containment, uh, which is turnkey at powder size. And then as mentioned uh, throughout the wet milling uh, slides in the presentation, we do have a developmental uh, bead mill and netch delta beta with grinding chambers from 15 mil to 300 mil uh, for developmental work on uh, or nano milled particles. So in, in summary, uh, with the overview and the case studies and the capabilities at powder size, um, the, the presentation focused on the micronization and nail and milling playing a critical role in effective formulation, design, and development uh, for dissolution improvement in the BCS classes 2A, effective bead layering, content uniformity, and optical uh, optimized particle sizing for effective pulmonary delivery. Uh, API and excipient micronization through air jet and wet milling to address bioavailability challenge, challenges and enable modified release formulations have been illustrated. And Capsa Gel has a wide range of particle engineering capabilities from design through commercialization, inclusive of jet mill micronization, complementary spray drying, including amorphous dissertions and pulmonary applications. Uh, Containment capabilities are onboard and turnkey for highly potent compounds, and wet mills for micro and nano size particle distributions are also available. So with that, I'll turn that back over to the host. Thank you, Adi and TJ. Uh, we will now shift over to the Q&A portion of today's discussion. If you haven't already, please feel free to submit any questions that you may have, and we will address them at this time. So our first question, uh, Audi, for the wet milling example that you showed, it appeared that sub sizing was not possible. Could you explain this a little further? Yeah, sure. Um, so I believe the question is uh, with respect to one of the case studies we went over for wet milling. So um, if we look at the slide, um, that's a great question because if you uh, if we look through the uh, the uh, robustness space there anywhere from two minutes to six minutes with the particle size that stays pretty constant so um, and that's a great question because for wet milling we we uh, we do envision that we can do sub micron size so in this particular case, we had selected the bead size and the mean residence time to enable the micronization because uh, we had uh, determined that that was going to be adequate for the bioavailability enhancement. If we had to use, we can certainly use the same mill uh, for a submicron or a nano sizing. And in that case, what we would change is the bead size that goes goes in there for for the iteration. Um, so, for example, the bead size in this case would be anywhere from half to one millimeter, um, whereas for the submicron, the bead size would be smaller, uh, maybe around 0.2 millimeters. And then also the mean residence time in this case, as you see there, uh, four minutes is what we selected. But um, in case of submicron um, sizing, we would go um, anywhere from half an hour to an hour. So it's definitely doable. OK, thanks, Audi. Our next question, um, I'm going to address this one to TJ. For the jet mill, is the particle size reduction primarily from the high-speed particles impacting each other or the chamber wall? Uh, that's a great question. So most of the particle size attrition is, is particle on particle collisions that are happening within the tornado. So once you establish steady state, which happens very quickly in the process, uh, and you have enough raw feed material in the mill 
um, those particles are constantly redirected off the walls or the grinding ring back into the tornado. So once established, that tornado is uh, it's all particle and particle collisions that I would estimate 99% of the collisions are, are that way. But certainly as you start up the process, there is uh, going to be uh, particles hitting jets and, and, and uh, hitting the walls until steady state is reached. Thanks, TJ. Um, for Audi, for case study number one, was the air jet micronized drug considered for wet granulation? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So what we what we did, as we showed, was we did use the air jet micronized drug for the dry granulation. And um, because uh, we had seen that one of the uh, biggest challenges there that we were having was sticking, um, we determined that the best way to avoid that sticking, and that we have employed this uh, in several other uh, uh, projects here at, within the DFS. Um, the wet granulation um, uh, allows for embedding of the API uh, surfaces such that the sticking doesn't become a concern. And so the best way uh, to enable that is to actually micronize the drug by using the wet mill, because by using the wet mill, we are accomplishing two things at the same time. One, we are reducing the size of the API to the required level, and two, in that process, we are uh, generating a suspension of the API with the uh, functional excipients that then we can use towards bed granulation. Okay, thank you. And that is all the time we have for questions today. So thanks again to Audi and TJ for your time, as well as our sponsor, Capsigel. If you'd like to take another look at the webinar or share it with a colleague, it will be available for on-demand viewing at farmpro.com starting tomorrow. And that concludes today's presentation. So thanks to everyone for attending, and have a great day.